Well, our last uh, speaker in this session is uh, Dr. Buhai. He's the clinical director of uh, gastroenterology and endoscopy in uh, King's uh, Hospital. And he's also the uh, clinical lead for the NS NSHX. He's going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence in, in GI. Thanks very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I noticed all the, all the other speakers have also kept to time, so I'm going to try and do the same. Uh, although we know that withdrawal time is important, so Let's take it slow as well. Um, disclosures. Um, it's, a, it's a huge topic. Uh, artificial intelligence is a, is a really wide-ranging topic, and I'm going to slightly cheat by, by putting this QR code up, because we, this is poignant for me, because it's the last face-to-face -face con conference we had in, in February last year. Royal College of Physicians, we, we ran a conference on AI, and it covered a lot of the important topics uh, about AI in gastroenterology specifically. Um, it's really well attended, but the, the, the lectures are all on YouTube, so if you do want to go and look them up. Um, I'm really pleased to say that actually some of, the answer, some of the questions that were posed at that conference have been actually answered over the last year even by the community, so that's really, really good going from, from, our, from our perspective. One of, the other, one of the questions, one of the main questions we, which we often hear is, am I going to lose my job to a machine? I can reassure the answer is emphatically no. Um, you will not lose your job to a machine, and there's several good reasons for that, some of which I'll go into in a second. Um, but there is, a, there is a, 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 a caution to be had, and this is uh, by, these, by these two uh, images here. Uh, the, I never learned to do a cosine when I was at school, but I can add. But I found that when I start using calculators, my, my skill at adding gets worse and worse and worse, and I can't for the life of me multiply anymore. So. Uh, there is a risk of losing skill to a machine if we depend on them. So that, that, that is a real risk. That's called automation bias. Um, there's also another risk that we're sold things which aren't really of any use to us. Um, so w the tail should not w wag the dog when it comes to artificial intelligence. We should be asking industry to provide tools that are useful for us. Um, and part of the misunderstanding comes from this idea of artificial intelligence as just machines doing things that humans would ordinarily do, or so-called so general artificial intelligence. We're not, we're not at that point yet, and that was the, 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 the idea that was coined nearly 60 years ago. Um, we have developed machine learning over the years, and that's be become very exciting, um, but we are in this space here. We are talking about, thing, we are talking about called, uh, uh, tasks of narrow AI. We're asking computers or algorithms to do very specific things. Um, computer vision is where we're at now in most endoscopic tasks. Things like recognizing a stop sign is, a, is an easy task for a computer, and that's all it does. It can't do anything else because we haven't, we haven't asked it to do anything else. So the machines are not coming for our jobs. Uh, deep learning is where it gets interesting, and this is, this is where there, is some, there are some ethical uh, um, uh, uh, considerations to be had. But uh, we're, not, we're not using deep learning systematically in any endoscopic indication at the moment, uh, although we are seeing the first examples of it. Um, deep learning is, is, or artificial neural networks are, are capable of making inferences, making their own inferences from, from, uh, from images without being told necessarily what that image is. Just make a conclusion and tell us what you think. Um, so there is, there is a way of, th th there is a problem with that inherent that we have to then understand what the computer, what the algorithm has done, and how it's arrived at that diagnosis. But so far, everything that we're asking algorithms to do and computers to do is narrow. Um, the other problem is that we don't, as a, as a specialty, we don't necessarily know how to critically appraise AI. I think it's uh, seen as a kind of, uh, it's part of your clinical acumen when a drug rep comes to you and says, use my new made up a name of map. Uh, for Crohn's, but and unless, unless you quiz them, unless you ask them about the trial design, about the placebo effect, about all of that, you're seen as, as, as not doing your job. But what about AI? How do we quiz AI? Um, well, we can ask a few simple questions, um, and some of, these, some, some of these are listed on the, on, the, on the slide there, but really, it's summarized by that one question for me. It's, it's so what? what? What is this doing for us? What is this task that's done, and what does it mean to the patient? Uh, also, you could just let somebody else reassure you that the due diligence has been done, and there's lots of people doing that now. NICE has set up their digital laboratory, NHSX, 
are, are, have a number of uh, uh, committees, organizations, structures involved in helping to evaluate, to, to standardize, and to reassure us that the products that are entering the market are now are, have gone through due diligence and uh, have been assessed in an appropriate way um, according to their, their intent. So apart from those introductory slides, where are we, where are we now? What, where, where is AI now and where are we going? Or perhaps where should we be going um, is the question that we should be asking. Um, there's lots. Uh, it's not just about polyps. There's lots of other things that artificial intelligence and its, and its disciplines can do for us. And these are, this is just a, a summary. It's by no means exhaustive. So there's a lot of things outside of the actual procedure itself that, that where AI can help. Um, a lot of the things that I show you on this slide are not really ready for prime time, but there are a few, and I'll go through some of these now, where artificial intelligence products or, 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 or computer vision products are already available on the market. Some of them probably outside in the, in the, in the exhibition hall as we speak. Uh, one of these, which I'd really like to promote uh, to you, uh, is, is, has, been, has been made almost entirely by a colleague of ours at Guys and St. Thomas's, Sebastian Zecchi. Uh, I'm not sure why he's turned his massive brain to being a gastroenterologist, because Sebastian is a, is a, a bit of a phenomenon. But he's created this thing called Endo Miner, which is a software program. It's a natural language processing software that will dive into your endoscopy report and extract data from it reliably. Um, so you could automate uh, your surveillance interval uh, strategies. You can automate um, linking your endoscopy reports with histology for calculating your adenoma detection rates. Um, and credit to Sebastian, this is, this is open source software. So anyone that you can be in contact with and, and be in contact with Sebastian, you can deploy this into your system uh, with, with a bit of work, but, but it, can be, it can be deployed safely and, 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 and free of charge. What about using artificial intelligence to quantify or quality assure your upper, upper GI endoscopy? Well, it can be done. Uh, this video is running on the, on, the, on, the, on the right of your screen as we speak, um, showing you that, that as... <laughs> You can, the, the, the little schematic on the bottom of that screen uh, highlights the bits of the stomach that you've seen. Um, so you can then be sure that you've seen all the bits of your stomach. And the trial that was, that was done, a uh, Chinese uh, trial that was done, showed that it reduces the, the uh, generation of blind spots during a, or unexamined portions of the, of, the, uh, of the examination by a significant amount. The problem with that is that then you, you treat to target. You sort of, you, sort of uh, you aim to play the system and just highlight the bits on the screen, not actually looking at the procedure that you're doing. Um, so we've got to be aware of how, how distracted we might get by the tools that are employed. But these kind of things are available and can, and can be achieved. Um, what about doing it in the colon? The colon is a bit more challenging because it's not always as predictable as the upper GI tract. Um, but this, there are people working on this now to create real-time 3D maps of the colon, transfer that to a 2D image, and overlay the blind spots, the bits that you've missed of the colon. We all know that there's a miss rate in colonoscopy. We know why it happens, um, but it's the first time that people have tried to quantify that in real time. So this is also not quite ready for prime time, but people are very much working on this. Uh, so you could then go back and look at the bit that you missed. And we know that, 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 that obviously these blind spots relate to missed, missed polyps, missed cancers, and that will relate to your post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer rate as well. Video capsule enteroscopy, it's a familiar technology to most of us now, um, but what we can now speed it up a little bit with, with, uh, with artificial intelligence. Um, the, the software will now pick up most abnormalities and flag them to you, thumbnailing the video, so that that reduces your reading time. Um, and improves your accuracy of diagnosis of video capsule. These products are available now to buy, um, so they are being deployed, and, and, and we're very pleased to say we've started using this at our institution as well. Um, and it feels like this is one of the products that will change our practice from day one. It will have an impact on the service from day one. We won't have to wait for a post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer rate reduction uh, three years hence, because our reporting time is being shortened straight away. Uh, what about computer-assisted detection, or CAD-E? This is where the, the algorithm or the software will, will put a bounding box around a polyp or an abnormality that it thinks is a polyp. 
in real time as you're doing the procedure. Showing you here three technologies. Um, on the top uh, left is the Fujifilm uh, technology, CAD-I. Um, on the top right is, is, um, is the GI Genius from Medtronic. Uh, and the bottom, uh, the other side, is the Pentax system discovery. So uh, the Olympus system is coming. Uh, uh, we're expecting it to be released in the next month or so. Um, so all the major manufacturers, and including Medtronic, that have a device agnostic um, system, uh, are, these are commercially available products now. Um, what does it do? Uh, well, it does increase your adenoma detection rate. Um, there's, been a, there's been several studies now around seven, six or seven studies now randomized controlled trials, a couple of meta-analyses meta as well, and it's consistent. There are clear benefits for CAD-E uh, across the site of the polyp, the size of the polyp, the morphology. The consistent benefit, fair enough, is for benefit for adenomas of around five millimeters or less. So we do then have to ask the question, well, so what? But we also do know that increasing your adenoma detection rate does reduce your post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer rate too. So th there, there is a benefit in there somewhere. We hasn't proven it yet, for sure, but, but th th it's an interesting uh, question to be asking. One of the things which I think we haven't proven is whether is how much benefit really is there in the real world outside of uh, randomized controlled trials. We put it in the hands of anyone with any skill level or any, any bowel prep level. Does it really do the same thing? Does it really achieve what we want it to achieve in real life? Um, and we have to be aware that as these things uh, are deployed, will that mean that we're de-skilled? I think with CAD-E, our, our initial experience is that actually no, there's a learning effect, actually, that you want to make your procedure as good as possible for the, for the, for the CAD-E to do a good job. Um, and I'll show you a couple of videos that demonstrate that right now. Um, here on the right, um, my right, your left, is, is, is a video with the, with the CAD, with these two videos are with the Fujifilm system. And just watch as we push this fold down with the cap. There was no way that any artificial intelligence was going to see that polyp unless I moved that fold out of the way. So there is technique involved here as well, but as soon as I press the button, it gives me a diagnosis. Um, same here, watch this fold. Um, there are all polyps in the sequence, I promise you. Um, and I'll try and speed up a little bit because we, we don't want to run out of time. But essentially what will happen is that we need to be slow, we need to be methodical, we need to use all the iterative things that we have. Has everyone watched this polyp? Can you see the polyp? Machine spotted it, but I didn't. And I went back, and there's the polyp. So there is an element of humans interacting with this machine to improve our technique as well as improve our, improve our detection rates. Um, and just, and ju just, they're not all bad. This is another one. Um, see if you can spot the polyp before the machine does. Three, two, one. Tiny, but it's very quick and very accurate at detecting polyps. So it's just drawing your eye, drawing your attention to something. It's not taking your job away. What about CAD-X? That's an interesting one, computer-assisted diagnosis. Um, I showed you some examples in the videos there, and I've, and I've put the TomTom, -tom, uh, other sat-navs are available, um, uh, on there, because when I bought my car, uh, when, I, when, I became, when I was a house officer, I had no idea what a sat-nav was, and then they, then they started coming out, and they were boxes that you had to attach to your dashboard. Now, they're integrated into the cars, and I think that's what we're hopefully going to see with artificial intelligence, is at the moment, they are sort of set-top boxes, but we need them to be integrated. Um, but we, not only do we need them to be integrated, I think we need them to be doing things that we want them to do, rather than just what the manufacturers have made for us. These are two CAD-X devices, the Fujifilm system on the right and the EndoBrain system on the left. It's worth saying that these are both tied to particular hardware. You can't use any other endoscopes with them. Um, but they, they use slightly different techniques. The EndoBrain gives you a sort of percentage diagnosis and lets you sort of agree or disagree with it, uh, whereas the Fujifilm system is very definite, just tells you that this is either neoplastic or not, um, or hyperplastic or not. Um, and then you can get on and, and do an ESD based on what you see if it says no invasive cancer. Um, so right now, CADEX is still in its early stages. Um, it's dependent on technology, um, and uh, the endocytoscope is the Olympus technology, which 
produces really high levels of accuracy. The endobrain system, which is the AI that's attached to it, is near perfect. It's near perfect in terms of predicting whether or not it's an adenoma versus hyperplastic, near perfect in predicting depth of invasion as well. So there is a really perfect system there. Can we use white light? Can, can it just be democratized and it doesn't matter what, and, uh, what um, manufacturer you're using? I think we can eventually, yes. Um, but we're, we're still waiting for those products to come out. Um, it's not just about uh, polyp detection, it's about quality assurance as well. And all of these things we are looking for artificial intelligence to help us with in terms of uh, improving our, our technique. Uh, couple, just last two slides. Um, so what we need to do now is to collaborate. We need, we need big data sets to get this task done. We need, we need huge national collaborations. We're working on that. Uh, we're, we're engaging with industry. Um, the ethical and regulatory considerations, I'm really pleased to say, are, are nearly done being worked on as we speak. Um, but we also need to train ourselves, train ourselves as a specialty to cope with this new technology and to get the most out of it, get the best out of it. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that um, it's just to remind you that this is a huge field. Um, please do stay tuned. It's not just about detecting abnormalities. It's about improving the quality of what we're doing as a, as a, as a, as a specialty. Uh, and the buck will always stop with you as the human. We are never, we're, we're never going to be in a position that we have to give our uh, diagnostic capabilities over to a machine. It's, not going to, it's just not going to happen. Uh, but things do look very promising for the next three or five years. And I'll leave you with the, the quote from my from my favorite film of all time. Uh, there is no fate but that which we make for ourselves. We have to shape that future. Um, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you for yet another excellent talk, Boo.